Wealth Matters is presented to you by Gaslitz Frankel, a law firm dedicated to resolving disputes involving your wealth, whether through your will, your trust, your business, or your investments. For news pictures and tips, go to our web, new website at gaslitzfrankel.com or follow us on Twitter at a state dispute. Our show's hashtag is Wealth Matters. Your hosts today are myself, Robert Ford, and my partner, Adam Gaslowitz, and today we're talking about preparing women for prosperity. Now it's time to introduce our guests. We're pleased to have with us today Stacy Hanley, partner at the law firm of Lefkoff, Duncan, Grimes, McSwain, Haas, and Hanley, and Tiffany Kent, um, founder of Wealth Engagement, LLC. The first question I want to ask both of you, and I'll, I'll start with uh, Stacy, is just if you could tell our audience just briefly, um, you know, who you are and what you do. Yeah, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for having me on the show. Um, like Adam said, I'm a partner in the law firm of Lefkoff Duncan. I practice in the area of tax and estate planning and business planning. The kind of my sort of upshot is I basically sort of transfer anything you own, whether during life or during death. So thank you so much for having me. All right, Great. Tiffany. And thank you so much for having me here as well today. So over the last 20 years, I've been a stock picker, portfolio manager in New York, working in hedge funds, and more recently a financial advisor at Bernstein Private Wealth. Left a couple of months ago to start my own firm um, because I was very much aware of this significant problem that most financial advisors um, uh, do out there, is that the majority of, of our clients don't invite women to the table. And um, I'm sorry, m most of our, my peer group doesn't really have, don't have really women at the table. And the majority of um, advisors out there, mean it means that women are not actually part of the conversation. And so I increasingly realized that, that this is a concern of mine. And so I started an independent wealth, and wealth management firm called uh, Wealth Engagement. Um, and my goal is to engage affluent women to dream, design, and build and invest in their financial future. So, so what, why is this issue important to the two of you? I mean, I know you, uh, Stacy and Tiffany, are both doing a lot of programs and, and seminars for women on the subject. I mean, what, what, what brought this up to the, uh, to the fore? Sure, I'll, I'll go first. Um, although it's been about five years since my dad, Wilmot, died, I can remember my mom on the phone a few days after he died asking our family's life insurance agent whether she had any money. And she honestly didn't know. And I kind of helped my mom through that estate administration process through my dad. And it took, you know, it was a pretty hard 18 months. And my mom had, you know, as a daughter, as a lawyer, helping her every step of the way. And most women don't have that kind of support network. So in my legal practice, I'm kind of seeing that women are not participating in this process. So they get blindsided by a life event and are sort of forced to participate. So unfortunately, you know, the heartbreak of my dad's death and helping my mom with the aftermath kind of delivered to me my purpose, which is to try to engage and empower women in this process before tragedy strikes. Um, and I'm gonna say this to Tiffany. I mean, when I, Tiffany and I, when she first moved to Atlanta, she and I met and we both quickly realized that this issue was important to both of us. And Tiffany can kind of share personally why it's important to her. And we thought it was important to kind of combine our resources and, and sort of be able to you know, present this to women some sort of educational piece that we could empower them. And we did our first one in February. We had about 30 women, it was live, it was great. And we thought we'd be doing a road show every month and obviously COVID hit and now we've got virtual audiences um, just like we have today. So, so we share a lot of the same passions um, for empowering and educating women in the financial and estate planning process. And yeah, if, yeah, I guess, sorry. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna chime in and say, you know, why this is so important to me was that I was basically that woman back in 2014, kind of unaware of how to really manage my own wealth professionally. Um, like most people, um, I went to a good college, you know, got a good job, made money, married, kids. Um, back in 2014, though, I had just left my third investment management job um, just for just being frustrated for certain reasons. Um, in particular, my, my boss was kind of ignoring some of my consumer uh, stock recommendations like Hi, Lululemon, it's a great stock. Um, but we just didn't do a lot in consumer, so it was hard for him to pivot. Um, so I, I grew really frustrated. And um, this is that back in 2014, I really did not know which way to turn. Um, do I stay home with the babies or do I, or with my children, or do I try and figure out a new path, a new pivot in my career? I worked, as I said, you know, 20 years on Wall Street, hedge funds, investment management world. And I just kind of didn't know where to go. And 
this actually caused a lot of stress in my life. And I ignored my money, ignored my wealth. And I didn't realize that that stress of not knowing which direction to take actually um, is worse. Like it's just, it's, it's, it's actually a greater stress, stress I've ever experienced than when I managed $200 million in New York. And what I discovered and what um, later figured out and Stacy and I then came together and put this presentation together is that if you don't know where you're going in life or what your dream is, then, then you just, you know, you, you get really anxious and stressed. And that's what we realized is that we really need to make sure that we engage women in what their financial future will look like. So they have a clear path as to where they're going. So I had to do a lot of soul searching back then. And I figured out that I had to pivot. And the one way I figured out that I could best um, pursue more financial dependence and be an entrepreneur was to no longer be a stock picker, but to go back to school basically and become a, a certified financial planner, um, which, you know, it's tough when you're doing something like that at age 44, the time I was. Um, but, you know, with life and in general, sometimes we have to decide to grow in different directions. And that was the big aha moment in my life is that I had stopped growing because I didn't know which way to go. And then I realized that I had a new direction and that's the one that I pursued. Yeah, one, of, one, of, one, of, one of our big aha moments was, um, uh, well, mine anyway, I've been doing estate litigation for you know, over 30 years and, uh, and, and often it's, it's dealing with the surviving uh, wife when a husband dies. And it was amazing to me how many of those uh, of, of surviving spouses uh, had the same uh, uh, response that Stacy's mom had, which was, uh, "Will I have enough money to survive?" And, and we were generally dealing with high, you know, high net worth kinds of clients, so there was plenty of money. And yet, that was always the fear. And I realized early on that that fear was based on just a lack of knowledge and understanding about the finances. So, uh, I was going to ask you why it matters that women engage in, in sort of the financial and estate planning process, and, and maybe that that sort of background is, is a good lead into that. I mean, these are the problems that we see, and I assume you're seeing that as well. What do you oh, think? absolutely. I mean, I think, um, and I'll kind of chime in first. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, and Tiffany can add more is like, you know, first problem is women may run out of money. I mean, if you have gotten out of the workforce to stay home and, you know, engage in the incredibly demanding work of building human capital, example, raising children, you have foregone opportunities, um, loss of income. And when you do go back into the workforce, we see a lot of women, you don't know your value. So you just kind of go back in, get a job, don't negotiate a higher salary, don't negotiate, just kind of take what you get. And all these things sort of compound over time where you end up with a lot of financial insecurity and God forbid you do have a divorce in your fifties or you do, you know, your husband dies and you're not prepared. I mean, we're seeing a lot of women who are, you know, in their sixties living off social security and that's about it. I mean, so it's really important that they from an earlier age start getting involved in the process and getting an understanding. And Tiffany can kind of maybe explain more also why women are so risk averse and, and kind of the negative effects of that. Yeah, so um, for example, the reason why we think we see a lot of women not engaging in um, financial planning and their estate plans is that, you know, they just have so many other priorities that are ahead of going to meet with the advisor or, or sitting down with their husband and, and really, you know, taking a look at, at all their finances because look, we've got 20 million things we've got to do. We've got, you know, kids to pick up, work, career, the house, the plumber, um, even the dog, right? <laughs> like you just have so many responsibilities. Um, and so we decide to, you know, really divide labor and say, okay, husband, you go deal with that. Um, and I'll deal with everything else. Or if a woman is involved in, in the meeting and engaged, unfortunately, and this is what I see a lot, is that um, most advisors kind of just focus on the portfolio and how it's performing and you know we beat the benchmark and um you know that's not that's not what her concerns are her concerns are she's gonna be okay um you know life isn't about beating the benchmark relative performance doesn't put food on the table <laughs> but what matters <laughs> most is the probability of success yeah, don't, don't, you also find that, don't you also right? find that a lot of advisors tend to talk to the husband in a couple not the wife yeah, because he's maybe a little bit more um, on top of the financial jargon and maybe he has bought some stocks himself. And, but that at the end of the day is not 
the the you know main objective of why you hire an advisor. You might you hire an advisor so that you can figure out what your goals and dreams are and how to fund those goals and dreams and to make sure that you have a, a portfolio that is is matched well with both husband and, and wife. I mean, the wife has this issue. I mean, we all have this risk that we face as women is that 80% of women die married. I'm sorry, single. <laughs> and 80% of men die married. So the husband is passing away way before the wife. And she's not thrown into this situation of being the, the main financial decision maker until she's widowed or singled or divorced. Um, sure. And so it's then difficult, or let's say back in the situation where both, both husband and wife are, are married, you have to take into account the longevity risk that the wife is going to have by, by living, uh, outliving their husband. And in fact, the portfolio has to account for that. And at some, at some point, at some point, the uh, the wife is going to be managing assets, either because husband has died or because they've gotten divorced, and she'll be now managing her half of whatever marital assets they were. At some point, she's going to fall into that role, mm -hmm. and um, and is going to be ill prepared for it. Now, let me let me jump in here because let me let me say that in preparation for this show, you you provided us Adam and I some some fabulous uh, information and PowerPoint presentations. And one, one of the data points that sort of shocked me uh, is you, you point out that 95% of women will be their family's primary financial decision maker at some point in their lives. Um, I, I sort of sensed being in this area that it was high, but not that high, which, which sort of touches upon some of the things you've already said. You should not stick your head in the sand and you should also not think, well, this will never happen to me. I'll, I'll always have someone to take care of me or there will be a breadwinner. Um, so, um, you know, and, and you've talked about divorces and, and so on and so forth. So the reality is that the probability of, of a woman having to deal directly and forthrightly with, with these issues is, is very high. So that, I, I guess, and, and uh, you touched upon this before, but um, how do you use that reality to suggest that you should not sort of, oh, I don't want to deal with this, stick my head in the sand, it's not my problem, it's too complicated, what, whatever you hear. How do you, how do you deal with that, Tiffany? I think that the most important thing is asking a woman, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in 10 years? A lot of people can't answer that question. Is, is the answer of lying on the beach by my beach house not appropriate? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that is living the dream. But um, more importantly, you know, if that is the ideal lifestyle, let's say in five or 10 years, let's just put together a financial plan to make sure that you can achieve that. And let's think about some of the factors um, in a plan that you can't control for. So for example, when I get to know a client really well and we figure out her dreams, her aspirations, her goals in life, whether she's with somebody or not, um, it's, very, it's very much of a crafted plan bespoke to her. And then we put together, then, then that's how women then start getting engaged and involved in understanding the numbers and then realizing that we can project out her financial future and help her realize that she is in control now to make some pretty important decisions that will affect her long-term ability to, let's say, live on the beach in 10 years. Yeah, I, I think it's important for us to say, we're not trying to change women's behavior or ask them to like toughen up or suck it up. Or I think when you ask someone to change their behavior, you only increase their anxiety, you don't lessen it. So I think we as advisors have to come to them and change our approach. So I think a lot of us as advisors are great at the design and build process. We're good at supplying data, good at doing fancy illustrations, giving opinions, being Miss and Mr. Informative. What we're not so great at is sort of the dream part, what Tiffany's talking about, asking the questions, actively listening. And that's where it changes with women. We need to come to them, not expect them to come to us. Yeah, you know, one, one of the great quotes, if I'm recalling it correctly from your PowerPoint, was I think Gloria Steinem said, D dreaming is in fact a, an aspect of planning. So um, 
and 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 what you're talking about is is taking those dreams and, and putting them into uh, uh, you know trying trying to pre I don't know plan project whatever the, the correct word is so so that that happens um, and and one of the other things I picked up from your uh, presentation and speaking with you is uh, and and you touched upon this a moment ago. Stacy is people don't like to be hectored, you know, you, they don't like to have people wag their finger at them and say, you shouldn't spend, you shouldn't do this. Um, I, 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 I just thought of a, a, a some, someone who I, I, I dealt with who needed some financial assistance and I sent them to an advisor and they called me back and said, oh, I felt so relieved. She told me I could still get my hair done once a week. <laughs> And, and it was that kind of, uh, you know, sort of connection rather than, uh, you know, you must do this, you must do that. So maybe speak about that a little bit, the, the ways in which you've sort of tuned in to how uh, to speak with women about these issues. Tiffany? Yeah, I think um, what's, what's really important is to put the decision making power back to the client or the, process, or the woman who you're meeting with because she is in control at the end of the day to make her own decisions, obviously, and you want to empower her to do that. So very simply, focusing on what she can control um, and don't worry about what you can't control. When you, when you worry about what you're fearful of or what you can't control in life, then those negative thoughts tend to then become repetitive and, and fearful and you make really bad decisions when you're under emotional stress. So it's important to keep on, you know, the, the brighter side of, of life and the things. Look, you have an amazing amount of wealth you've accumulated. Let's figure out how you would like to live out your lifestyle. Um, and the things that you can control are, of course, you still get your hair done, but maybe you don't need to buy a $5 million um, lake house. Maybe you can buy a $3 million lake house and we can kind of figure out those different financial scenarios that she would like to make long-term down the road, but making, you know, small short-term decisions that are more meaningful and significant and that could, you know, that could have a longer term implication on her financial future. Those are the big decisions that we need to focus on as opposed to little tiny lifestyle um, adjustments here and there. <laughs> yeah, and, and Robert, it's kind of hard. I mean, when you had a woman who's been thinking about everyone else, who's been selfless for most of her life, it's hard to get someone to start thinking about what she wants. She's always been worried about taking care of other people. I had a client come in and wanted me to review her estate planning documents, and her husband had driven the process for years. She kind of wanted to understand, and they were getting ready to update them, and she didn't want to go back to the attorney they had used before. She wanted, she just kind of felt stupid asking questions, so she came to me. And I said, before I look at any of this, I said, what do you want to happen? And she looked a little dumbfounded and said, well, no one's ever asked me that before. I don't know. And I said, well, I mean, I can't really help guide you if you don't really know what you want. So you have to get you know, women to kind of sort of get rid of the full plate, get a clean state, clean slate, and kind of just think about what, are, what is important to you. Like, what are your fears? What are your hopes? And kind of start from there. So, so wh wh why is it that women are not and haven't historically participated much in this process. I mean, I know if you go back far enough, you know, women couldn't own property uh, without their husbands signing off on things. And, and, and the finances were, were, were just sort of delegated as men's work, probably because men said they were. Um, so I understand how, this, how we got here. I just don't know why we're still here. Why, why is it still a process that women are largely um, either intentionally or unintentionally excluded from? Yeah, I, I can start on that. Um at least from Wall Street's perspective, we like to make things incredibly complex so we can charge high fees. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like, not, I mean, more seriously, like the world is really complex, right? And as lawyers, as advisors, as portfolio managers, like, you know, it is, there's a lot of different risks and scenarios and things we have to figure out to manage money, to manage clients, to do legal documents. However, if you just start with a very simple question, what, what is it that you want? And create a plan. And I think that's why I think what, what Stacey and I are realizing is that trying to keep it as simplified as possible and not making it so complex is how you engage women. Um, yeah. And also too, I mean, Adam, there's still a lot of societal conditioning out there that women should be 
not demanding, not ask what they want. We're meant to be kind, compassionate, selfless. You know, you just be wear these like badges of honors. And being demanding or asking is masculine behavior. It's offensive. What happens is women, you know, don't ask, they don't receive. The other thing we still see is that women are still less likely to speak up and more likely to be interrupted when they do. So I've had numerous times where I'm at a conference room table, husband and wife, woman, wife's just quietly sitting there nodding. I had a recent situation with prospective client where the husband was in the camera on the Zoom. The woman is out of sight. Any question I asked, he answered or asked her, came back to him, to to me. And not only in that case, she was you know, not only not heard, but she wasn't even seen. So there's still this sort of societal conditioning of you know, don't be too demanding, don't be too pushy, don't be, and it, what it leads to is women just being quiet. In fact, I've, I've, I've recently seen um, and read in a lot of different, I mean, I've seen this in a couple of different blogs and books I've read recently, and um, it's this book called In the Regrets of the Dying by Bronnie Ware. I don't know if you've heard of this book, but she was a hospice nurse, and she interviewed and, and met with, you know, hundreds of patients over a couple of, you know, five or 10 years and she started writing about it. And she said, um, the majority of patients in their final days regretted most that they did not live a life of their own. They lived a life that others expected of them. And so when you're conditioned to think that, oh, you know, my, as a woman, sometimes we're, we're conditioned to think that we're, our main objective in life is to make sure we care for others and not live a life that that's true to ourselves. And that can be, that can be the issue. Yeah, that, that's, that's very profound. You don't want to get to your last years and have uh, those kind of thoughts. You're listening to Wealth Matters, the radio show where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. We are your hosts, Robert Port and Adam Gaslowitz from the fiduciary litigation law firm of Gaslowitz Frankel. We are talking today with Stacy Hanley, a partner with the law firm of Lefkoff, Duncan, Grimes, McSwain, Haas and Hanley, and Tiffany Kent, a CFP and founder of Wealth Engagement, LLC. And we're talking today about preparing women for prosperity. Let me touch upon um, something that, that uh, you, you briefly referenced, which is, uh, I think what Warren Buffett likes to call all of the various helpers out there in the financial world. Um, and, and that can be complex. It can be confusing. So I've, I've got maybe two questions that are interrelated. I think one is what do you tell clients about listening to or tuning out all the noise you hear from the media? And secondarily, um, I know from your presentation that you advocate putting together what some people will call a team or a support group, you know, the CPA, the advisor, the attorney. Talk, talk about how, uh, I think they're interrelated. Tell, tell me if I'm wrong and tell me how you deal with that, Stacey. Sure, I mean, I think, you know, keen on women, you know, women like to collaborate. I mean, that's kind of a natural sort of characteristic of women. So getting a team, a collaborative team together of a CPA, a financial advisor, a life insurance professional, an attorney, kind of all working towards one goal. I think, you know, and just like, you know, as Tiffany and I talk about our sort of dream design build process, you know, you can't build a house, you know, without the team, without the architect, without the builder. So it's kind of a similar process. And, and so we kind of engage women on trying to find the right advisors and part of the process, you know, be able to ask the right questions. And we kind of have an adage at our firm that like, no one cares how much you know till they know how much you care. And that should be your advisor. You know that your advisor cares first and then you get that, you know, what they know. What so about all of the um, inputs that people have? You know, the, the um, nephew who's just joined a, mm -hmm. a brokerage firm or insurance company, the, uh, you know, the, the friend of a friend who uh, wants them to invest in X, Y, Z. How, how do you deal with, with all of the, um, the I'll, I'll call them challenges of navigating this? Tiffany? Yeah, I think that um, there is something to be said about friends and family that, let's say, manage money or advisors or, or your CPA versus those that you can professionally hire. When, 
with a professional hire, at least you can always fire them if you feel like they're not a right fit. You really can't fire family members. Um, and so I, I don't think that that's usually the best course of action. I also think that an advisor, whether they're a CPA, um, a financial advisor, a lawyer, they can do their functional job very well. And that's, that's one thing you need to look through in terms of their credentials, their experience. And that's one level way of, of thinking. The other way of thinking as a person trying to hire somebody is that, do they have my best interests at heart? Um, are they putting my, my, my interests ahead of their own as a fiduciary? And also, are they really helping me make a good decision, like a financial decision or um, a decision in, in, a, in a document? And then if, and let's think about how we're making that decision and what are the, the concerns or the emotional and the financial considerations to, to lay out. Um, if anyone kind of just glosses over certain aspects of those two different buckets, the emotional and the financial, then I think that there's something missing in that advice equation. And I imagine one way to show that you care is uh, actually listening to what your client says to you. And um, rumor has it men aren't always the best at listening to women. Um, is that some of the problem? Let, I mean, you can't really understand what your client's needs and wants are and what their fears and concerns are if you don't engage with them and actually listen to them, listen to them actively. Well, I think that, that um, and I'll, I'll just kind of um, interject a little bit, and that is people will listen to you if you tell them a story. And if they can see themselves in, in, that, in those shoes, and if they can relate to that story and what the outcome was, then they'll listen to you. No, I, think, I think Adam's question may have been a little different, which is whether the advisor is listening and what 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 i sense and and part of my background is is doing securities litigation and arbitration on behalf of individuals who have issues i'll politely say with their advisor is that that you know that my sense is the advisor didn't listen the advisor had a plan or maybe the same plan for everyone mm -hmm. and i think that's what you know across the board and maybe particularly with with the um with the women, women who you um, are, are focusing on, who who, who need the, the type of, of uh, support you're you're directing, you know, you you need to be attuned to whether someone's listening to you or whether, you know, whatever you tell them, they're going to sell you X, Y, and Z. And the example I often give is that that's why when you go shopping. There are clothes of different sizes, different colors, and so on and so forth, because not everyone wears the same size. And and I've I've often seen folks where people have a, you know, there's there's one thing they promote and one thing only, and you visit them no matter what your financial problem, you're gonna walk out the door with whatever it is, an annuity, a private placement insurance, whatever it is. So uh, Stacy, you're, you're nodding your head is uh, <laughs> in agreement. Right. Yeah. Well, I think people know that 80% of communication takes place non-verbally. And obviously it's hard with Zoom meetings and meetings with face masks, but there's still things you should do as an advisor, you know, as, you know, that to actively listen, meaning nodding, like sort of recounting back what the person is saying, like reflection. So I understand you're saying, you're telling me, and so they, so, so they know you're listening. Um, and obviously just showing respect, like, I mean, just, and just letting, you know, that you value this person, you value their opinion. It's not just, you know, for you to be in the meeting kind of touting off what you know or sliding them into a product or me putting them into a form. It's, it's more about that. Like, so I think the act of listening is more than just listening with your ears. It's listening pretty much with your whole body. I mean, taking notes, nodding, again, mirroring back, letting them know, I mean, that you are listening. How do, how do you convince um, people who, and, and again, we're talking about women primarily in this case, uh, how do you convince them that, that the, the, the ideas about financial planning and, and various other um, um, issues related to finances are not as complicated uh, and incomprehensible as they think? I, I mean, I, you know, I think about my dad trying to, trying to work his new cell phone and it's just, you know, he, he believes it's too complicated and so he just has that mindset. How do you, how do you convince people who believe that the finances are just always beyond them uh, that it's not that it's that it's something that is easy easily understood and um and get them comfortable with that concept yeah there's there's probably it, 
You know, I, I don't want, I don't mean to say that finances are not complex. I mean, they, they are, we, we spend a lot. There's a lot of factors that go into stock movements and the way that I approach it is that the best way to think about it is to put things into buckets. So when you think about your own income statement and balance sheet, um, and maybe these are not necessarily terms that um, people think about in everyday life, but we all have income and expenses and hopefully we're saving 20%, but so I like to put things in to three buckets. So of your expenses, 50% <laughs> of, of your after-tax income should be only spent towards essentials. Um, your mortgage, your insurance payments, healthcare, transportation. 20% um, towards savings, as I mentioned. And then the last bucket, 30% are what I like to say that are flexible. So flexibles are things that you don't need if um, the economy were to go down to the toilet or like maybe what we're experiencing right now exactly. Um, the flexibles are travel, entertainment, luxuries. Um, and the way that I like to advise clients is that if you lose your job um, or the economy was really weak and your income for some reason just almost went to zero, um, if you're an entrepreneur that is, you'd like to have at least on the side one to two years of your expenses, the essential expenses, that 50% bucket in cash so you can support your lifestyle. Why that's so important is that, let's say you do have an investment portfolio, and let's say the market's really wobbly. You never really want to ever sell when everyone else is selling because that's an emotional-based decision, but you're selling because you might be fearful that you won't be able to support your lifestyle if you're to lose your job. Well, we know that market corrections are on average about one to two years. This one came back so much faster than anyone expected. Um, but had you had this cash on the side, and let's say you did lose your job, then you don't have to react like everybody else is reacting. And you can wait out the storm and wait for things to recover. One of, one of the things that, that I think your, your answer illustrated, Tiffany, is that... Um, you know, some, some sort of blood-based rules, I'll call them, you know, not, not set in stone, but I, I often think that's what people don't understand. They get barraged with, you should save, you should invest, you should do this, you should do that. And, and in about, you know, 45 seconds, you laid out a, a set of, you know, rules. Again, they don't have to be followed to the penny or to the T, but but to sort of put someone's life in order. And, and I think that's a segue to, to something that I, uh, one of you referred to before, which is your idea of having a blueprint. The analogy was made to building a house. You know, you have a blueprint and plans and you sort of scope out what the cost is gonna be and when you're gonna finish and all that. So um, Stacy, why don't you talk a little bit about what your, um, approaches to, to calling this a blueprint and how that helps sort of conceptualize for people the approach you're taking. Sure, kind of going back to what you're saying, and Adam's saying, how do you simplify this process? I mean, it's just like the old adage, you know, how do you eat an elephant, you know, one bite at a time. We try to break down into three major steps. Dream, like, just like you would dream, you know, your dream house, whether you wanted a you know, house in the mountains or a condo in town. Then we'd go through the design process, which is sort of understanding your numbers, figuring out what your budget is, how much you could borrow to build the house, just like figuring out how much you can spend to sort of fund these dreams you have. And last is sort of the building and just kind of like my dad, I'm the builder, sort of the builder of the estate planning documents. So that sort of builds and protects your assets, just like a house protects you from the storms. And the reason we kind of do this, Tiffany and I kind of bounced around, we were coming up with this process while we landed on the house is like, most women relate to it. I mean, it's something they've thought about, they dreamed about, um, and we, we kind of just like that analogy. And we liked it in three steps, dream, design, build. That doesn't sound so difficult. If I say crafting a financial and estate plan and investing, you immediately, that's, no, I don't wanna touch that. But if I'm thinking I'm doing three steps, it just seems a little bit more manageable. And just to add to that too, it's like anyone can relate to the idea of, um, you have this idea of a dream house, and let's say you kind of forgot to put together a budget and you hire this big construction crew, an architect, and then you build this house, it's beautiful, it's amazing, but oh my gosh, you went way over budget. Like, oh, you might not be able to support your life. And so people come to relate to that. Or let's say you do the opposite end. And let's say you do put, create a budget 
but you don't hire the right team or you kind of make some decisions later on and they weren't the right decisions and then you might not have a house that's really well built. So um, those kind of trade-offs between, you know, when you build a house, it helps you realize that in life we're making trade-offs and decisions on our finances so that we can achieve that dream. And to tie that into what we talked about a moment ago as part of your blueprint of dream design build, you know, the design involves the, the team you just spoke about and then build are, are the actual, um, you know, if, if I'm gonna continue uh, with this analogy to building, you know, the support structure for that. Uh, make sure your estate planning is in place. Make sure your beneficiary designations are in place. Make sure, you know, you've got your insurance, both life and health and property, so that, um, you know, I think a large part of this for me as I reflect on it is A, developing some sense of security and B, being able to weather surprises you know, whether, whether um, the type of situation uh, Stacy spoke about earlier, you know, a death that turns everything upside down, or we're having folks in the Gulf who are having their houses blown down, or, you know, we have health issues, whatever it is. So you can try and weather that as best you can. That, that's exactly it, Robert. And I'm, when we get to the build process, I mean, it's kind of, I find women a lot of times, even though they might have, and, you know, have, but they, th they think they have what they have in place. They have a will or there may be a trust, but they don't understand it. They haven't really read it and understand it. So I try to ask women to like, what do you think this says? What do you think this means? And a lot of times they're kind of surprised. Oh, I'm in this trust with the kids from the first marriage and now I'm the trustee and wait, what? And then, then they end up with your firm because, of, because there's issues arise where they didn't understand it from the beginning. So a lot of times you know, they might say, oh yeah, I've got a will, I'm fine. Or I've got this trust, I'm fine. Well, really? I mean, you know, let's really look and see what it says and what this actually means for you. Or they've named, you know, a corporate trustee, you know, to manage money for them that they you know, have no relationship with. So, um, so that's, I think that's very important, not just to build them, but to understand what they say. You're absolutely right. We, we spend a lot of time, I mean, and frankly, I, 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 this is part of the practice I enjoy is sort of unwinding and understanding the financial situations folks are in. Unfortunately, it's not pleasant for them by the time they get to a fiduciary litigation firm, but I, I, I like to feel that I, I help them sort that out and, and uh, try and get them on the right path. And also to um, continue on that analogy um, reference with the dream bill design um, and best part is the fact that you know, like a foundation to a house, you need to make sure you have a portfolio that can support, you know, your lifestyle and future self into the years ahead. All right, well, um, we're, we're getting close to the end of the show. And before we do, I wanted to at least give uh, each of you an opportunity to sort of uh, tell the audience about some, a success story that you've had, or, or maybe a, a, a failure that could have been prevented had uh, a client done something different. And uh, why don't I start with you, Stacey? Okay. Um, well, I just had something, I had a potential female client call me yesterday and, um, and I was actually on the phone with her and, and I listened to the story, talk, talk, talk. And I said, well, you know, why don't we meet so you can get a comfort level with me? And she said, well, I actually already have one. So I felt like that first just 15 minute conversation, just actively listening, repeating about I me, mean, basically going through these steps, even though it was on the phone, it wasn't even a physical thing. So I think my successes are when I meet someone and they come in and they're stressed, they're worried, they're scared. And we kind of talk and we talk through their fears, talk through their hopes and, and I just listen. And then all of a sudden I see their shoulders come down, they let out a deep breath and they sort of think to themselves, okay, I can do this. And I don't, you know, give false hope or whatever. And even just yesterday, I didn't give one second of legal advice. I didn't say one thing. I didn't say she, I just literally just listened and, you know, now she's going to come in. So to me, that was sort of success that I had, you know, kind of practiced what I preached. Tiffany? Yeah, so um, I have this situation where um, I prevented, I think, um, a failure. I don't want to say failure, but it wouldn't have been that disastrous of a situation. But um, a client friend um, texted me and said, hey, I'd like to buy um, this lake house. And, you know, I know her portfolio and her financials really well. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, that sounds fine. Sounds like you should 
you know, that sounds great, but let's talk about it. So we get on the phone and we flesh out all the details. And the idea is that, you know, we like to have a place where we can enjoy um, our life outside um, with the kids and they can bring their friends and we can get out of the busy Atlanta area and like, wow, that sounds amazing. But, you know, so your kids are almost out of the house. You're going to be an empty, empty nester next year. Is this a place that you're going to feel comfortable going to by yourself? She's like, no. Well, <laughs> I'm like, well, then that's probably not the best. Um, I know you want to develop these great long-term memories in the next year, but maybe that's not the best place for you to buy a second home if you're not comfortable going there by yourself. And um, that was hard, really hard, because, you know, obviously her kids wanted the place and she was about to make a bid on it. And I'm like, oh my God, I hope I'm, you know, I'm advising you on the right thing. <laughs> and I'm like, well, long term, like I say, I said to her, I see myself, you know, 10 years, maybe I'm semi-retired, maybe I'm not. Um, you know, I'd like to have a, a house on the beach, like, you know, a really nice community and feel comfortable. She's like, well, wait, that's, that's what I want too. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, then that's what you should be thinking about. More long term as to where you'd like to live when you're an empty nester and the kids can come back honestly and, and visit you and have a great time at the beach as opposed to the as opposed to the lake but also too right now all these beach properties and lake properties have gotten bid up so it's like you're going to be buying at the top of the market like you kind of maybe want to wait also too at least a year or two until things kind of um you know get back to normal and people aren't demanding these vacation houses um, that was the more logical first impression like wait don't buy at the high of the market <laughs> but then i drilled down and realized it was probably better for her to wait for other reasons all right. Well, thank, thank you both. Uh, let me give you both an opportunity to, to tell our listeners how they can uh, reach you if they want to contact you. And uh, Stacy, I'll come back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's Stacy Hanley. You can reach me by phone at 404-262-2000. You can also email me at shanley, H-A-N-L-E-Y, at ldfirm.law. And our website is ldfirm.law. And I think you can follow me on social media under Stacy Hanley, estate planning attorney on LinkedIn and Facebook. So Thanks, Adam and Robert, for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed chatting with you guys this morning. All right, yeah. Tiffany. Thank you, Robert and Adam, too, for having us both on the show. We really enjoyed this opportunity. The way to reach me best right now is Tiffany, T-I-F-F-A-N-Y, just like the jewelry store, at <laughs> Wealth Engagement. <laughs> wealth Engagement, I know, kind of might sound like every other wealth management firm out there, but I think I am a little bit different because... I really want women to engage with their wealth. I know I'm not expecting anyone to marry their wealth, but just be a little bit more engaged. <laughs> so Tiffany at wealthengagement.com and my cell phone number, fortunately it's still a New York number, is 917-826-5955. <laughs> thank you both very much for an for a excellent and informative discussion. Uh, as we're wrapping up our show, I want to thank everyone for listening to Wealth Matters, where we discuss the opportunities and challenges of preserving and managing wealth. For more information about Guest Lewis Frankel, please go to our website at guestlewitfrankel.com. And remember to follow us on Twitter at Estate Dispute and use our show's hashtag, Wealth Matters. Our guests today were Stacy Hanley, a partner with the law firm of Lefkoff, Duncan, Grimes, McSwain, Haas, and Hanley, PC, and Tiffany Kent, a CFP, and for those who don't know, that stands for a Certified Financial Planner, and Tiffany is the founder of Wealth Engagement, LLC. Please join us every fourth Wednesday of the month at 8.30 a.m. here at Wealth Matters on Business Radio X. Mm -hmm.